So I'm Kay Maher, I'm a professor in the School of Earth Sciences in the Department of Geological and Environmental Sciences, and I am a geochemist. And most people don't know what a geochemist is, that's okay. It means I study the chemistry of earth materials, including um, fluids, solids, soils, gases, and the organisms that live there. And my particular area of expertise is what we call reactive transport, which means that I'm interested in the fundamental coupling between chemical reactions and the transport of aqueous or gaseous species. And so effectively what we do is sort of like chemical engineering of the subsurface. And that brings me to think about geologic carbon sequestration as this process of managing both the transport and reactions of fluids and gases in the subsurface. And what's actually very unique about the earth sciences is that the dimension of scales that we cross, and so I've tried to depict that for you here, but we think about things at the kilometer scale, where this is a basin where there's an oil and gas reservoir underneath, to the nanometer to micron scale of mineral surfaces. And the picture on the right is the idea of trying to combine, react CO2 with mineral surfaces to convert large portions of the subsurface into carbonate minerals. So this is actually a natural rock formed entirely of CO2 and magnesium. And I put it up here because it's sort of a special rock. It was formed by CO2-rich fluids interacting with a rock called serpentinite, which is a magnesium silicate rock. It's also the California state rock. And <laughs> most importantly, when you guys go to Jasper Ridge this afternoon, the ridge proper at Jasper Ridge is actually composed of serpentinite, the California state rock. And it lends some unique chemical properties to the soils there, which allow different ecosystems, very uh, unique and endemic ecosystems to California. So it's part of why Jasper Ridge is there. And at the end, I'll tell you why we think it's a good idea to turn CO2 into a rock. Um, but before I, wanna, before I go there, I want to mention how that issue of scale comes into the topic of geological carbon sequestration. And I think when we start to evaluate strategies for carbon sequestration, we often don't ask the right questions. And that leads to excluding or downplaying some strategies which, which actually might be needed and useful. And so I want us to think about both the different scales in terms of how big is the solution to the problem? How big could it be at scale in terms of making a dent in the total magnitude of carbon emissions that we need to reduce? But also, how long is it useful for? How long will it sequester carbon? Because taking 10 moles of carbon out of the atmosphere is not very useful if 10 moles go back into the atmosphere tomorrow, whereas it might be better to wait a little bit and take five moles of carbon out. Um, so the time scale over which this sequestration mechanism can operate and then finally, when? When can this mechanism or technology get to scale? It might not do us very good if we wait 100 years to sequester that 10 moles of carbon versus doing 5 moles of carbon today. So um, how big, how long, and when? And I hope to convince you that carbon sequestration is big. We can do it today, and it will hold the CO2 in the subsurface for a long time. Um, and again, I, I, I thought it would be interesting to also bring in not only the issue of scale from the geoscience perspective, but also the, our perspective on climate change and what's happening today relative to what's happened over most, most of Earth's history. And so I just want to start off with a, a quote. This quote was in the newspaper around the time the House voted to prohibit the military from acknowledging um, climate change as part of their planning strategy. And it was a very symbolic vote, but this quote appeared in the newspaper from Representative David McKinley, who said, climate change alarmists contend that man-made CO2 is the cause of climate change. Most people may not realize that 96% of all the CO2 emissions occur naturally. And so I'm not going to touch the first part of this quote, but I want to talk a little bit more about that second part of this quote. So what do people think? True, false, or I have no idea? Let's see some hands. True. Couple. Okay, your professors are not here, it's okay. <laughs> False. False, okay, I have no idea. All right, <laughs> excellent. So I'm, I'm going to tell you the answer, and it turns out as, as armchair scientists, even without a degree in geosciences, you could evaluate this, this quote that appeared in the newspaper. And so I'm gonna just walk you through that with a very simple diagram of the carbon cycle. And so what's shown here are the major reservoirs of carbon. The atmosphere is 750 petagrams, which is also equivalent to a gigaton. Um, the oceans are very large, 38,000 gigatons of carbon. And the plants and soils, the, the biosphere, are collectively about 2,000. Um, so 
the key question we're after is not so much what's the size of the reservoirs, although we'll come back to the size of these reservoirs. What's interesting is the size of the fluxes. And so I'm going to start with the biosphere, which is over in the section of the diagram. So we have photosynthesis taking up 120 petagrams of carbon per year. And most of that carbon, in fact, all of that carbon is returned through soil respiration and plant respiration. So the net contribution to the atmosphere in terms of CO2 from the biosphere is effectively zero. We can then look at the ocean, and the ocean exchanges CO2. Currently, we have a net flux of two um, petagrams per year of CO2 into the ocean, and that's driven primarily by the increase in CO2 over the, the um, last several decades. And over geologic time, these two fluxes have also balanced out to a net of zero. And so if we go back to our esteemed congressman's quote, it turns out if we sum up all of these gross fluxes of CO2 to the atmosphere, emissions from humans, the 6% or the 6 petagrams per year and this 0.9, roughly 7, is actually 3% of natural CO2 emissions. So why do we have a problem if human emissions are, always, are only 3% of natural? Of course, you have probably all taken a finance class, and you know that it's not the gross that matters, but the net. And so if we turn this diagram around and look at the net carbon fluxes, we see the problem emerge. And so over long time scales, the carbon cycle, we can think of it in terms of the amount of CO2 in the reservoirs, the difference between the fluxes in and out, are governed by the difference between volcanoes, which are the only natural net source of CO2, and what's buried in the sediments. And so the difference between those two is zero, which is why we've had roughly stable atmospheric CO2 levels over time. We know this because we've had liquid water on Earth. If we add in the imbalance that humans are creating in this cycle, we can see that seven petagrams per year is roughly 70-fold what volcanoes are spewing out naturally. And so this is the profound impact that humans are having on the climate system. This is roughly the equivalent to creating, in terms of a geologic agent, creating 70 new volcanic chains about the size of the Cascades all around the planet. So imagine 70 new volcanic chains popping up in the world. That's a huge footprint. And that's about the scale of the footprint that anthropogenic emissions are creating. And I'll just add that the Earth has never experienced such an abrupt change. And another way to think of this instead of volcanic change is to think of going 70 times the speed limit. That's 4,900 miles per hour. That's about Mach 6. <laughs> So imagine the speeding ticket you would get, and it's fair to say we've never even created a machine that can go 70 times the speed limit, um, at least um, on Earth. Okay, so that's the geologic perspective, and keep in mind the seven gigatons of carbon. That's a really big number that we have to deal with. Um, and so carbon dioxide capture and storage is one proposed approach for dealing with at least part of this carbon problem. And the way that this works is, is basically we can think of it in four steps. And so we capture the CO2 from a point source, usually a power plant, although there are other plants that emit CO2 for industrial purposes that could also be um, subject to capture. So we capture the CO2, we compress it, and we pipeline, we transport it via a pipeline to the geologic storage site. And one of the challenges that I'll come back to later is this process of capture and compression, which I'm not going to talk about, but there are people here at Stanford that do a lot of work on capture, um, is that there's a big energy penalty, and it's somewhere between um, the DOE goals, about 35%, and you know, could be as high as 60%, depending on the capture process and the plant. So there's a big energy penalty there. Um, and that brings us to what we would like to do with the CO2 is to put it underground in a storage site. And you can see from this diagram that there are a couple of things we're doing. The first thing is that we're injecting it deep into the subsurface, so several kilometers down. So I think for reference of scale, we're probably about a kilometer from downtown Palo Alto right now, maybe a little bit more. So that's the depth, minimum depth that we're talking about. So deep into the subsurface, um, we're looking for places that aren't useful to humans. In other words, they have water or gas that is not useful or drinkable. So we're away from useful resources. And the third most important criteria is that we're looking for some sort of physical barrier, some sort of cap rock that keeps the CO2 from migrating up to the surface, where it may impact drinking water aquifers and other valuable resources. And so going back to this idea of, well, how big is it? How big could it be? If we look at all of these sedimentary storage reservoirs, and of course oil and gas is one example because we know that the oil and gas has been trapped there, so it qualifies in terms of the metric of um, trapping or physical 
boundaries to CO2 migration. So we have oil and gas reservoirs, unmineable coal formations, and saline aquifers. And beneath, I've put the number of years that we could sequester at current emissions rates all of the CO2 from fossil from power plants. Um, and so that's 60 years worth of US emissions for oil and gas up to 1,000 years for saline aquifers. So this would be capturing about two and a half gigatons per year of CO2 and injecting it into the subsurface. So we have quite a big capacity. What happens in these subsurface storage reservoirs? This is showing you a phase diagram for CO2. And what we have is pressure and temperature. And this black line shows the critical point for CO2. And I've put what we call geothermal gradient. So this is the change in temperature with depth into the Earth's crust. And most of the places where we're planning to inject CO2, these deep injection sites, are somewhere within this range between the two basins where CO2 is a supercritical fluid. So we have both supercritical fluid and brine down in these environments, which creates some interesting conditions for storage. And it's part of why this technique actually works. Um, so the first thing to know about supercritical CO2 is it's more buoyant than water, and so it tends to rise to the top after it's injected. And this is a hypothetical cross-section showing what a CO2 injection might look like. And over on the right is an array of different trapping mechanisms. These are the mechanisms that immobilize the CO2 in the subsurface. And it shows their dominance over time. So as we inject the CO2, it travels up and it rests against this impermeable cap rock or this physical barrier to CO2 migration. And for those of you who are, at least have some background in geology, this is usually things like shales or very low permeability units that are resistant to flow. Um, over time, we have other trapping mechanisms that kick in. So this is physical trapping where we just have free CO2 against the seal. We also have capillary trapping or residual trapping where some of the CO2 is left behind in pore space and immobilized. You can see the CO2 surrounded by the brine. And then over time, as the brine and the CO2 mix, we get what we call solubility trapping, which is where the CO2 dissolves into the brine. So we have aqueous CO2 at that point. And then over time, we start to get the formation of minerals. And here we're showing the combination of dissolved calcium with carbonate to form a mineral called calcium carbonate, which is also limestone. And so what you can see is this is very schematic. But over time, we go through this range of trapping mechanisms. And the idea is that as we go out in time, the actual storage security of a sequestration site actually increases. As we start to dissolve more CO2 in the fluid, it becomes less buoyant. And then as we form minerals, it's essentially permanently immobilized. And coming back to this issue of, of scale and the trade-offs between different strategies, I think we should keep all strategies on the table. But there are some different things to think about. So this is a plot showing the characteristic storage time for carbon in these different sequestration strategies. And this is the storage capacity. So this is a complicated diagram. If you'll just ignore all of the blue lines and all of the green lines, we'll just look at some of these big fields. And so. The other thing to point out is that this particular author and visualized this as a power law. So these are log log plots. So here's our underground injection site up here with you know, close to 1,000 gigatons of storage relative to our 7 or 8 gigatons of CO2 emitted. And the idea is that CO2 in these environments would be stable there for upwards of 1,000 to 10,000 years. Of course, there's huge uncertainty on this diagram, but that's, the, the, that's what our basic understanding at this point tells us. Um, comparison to soil carbon, which is that smaller reservoir of carbon we saw back in the carbon cycle diagram, this is a smaller reservoir, and it's also much more subject to rapid turnover. If you think about organic carbon in the subsurface, there's lots of organisms there that would like to eat it. It's sort of like Twinkies for microbes, and so they tend to consume a lot of the organic carbon, so it just doesn't stick around very long. So um, that's a rapid turnover in that pool versus a long-term stable pool. So why are we doing this? We have, we've met a couple of our metrics in terms of large scale. Um, there are still some technical challenges. I'll tell you where I think we are with some of these. So, so in the physical trapping, this is the physical emplacement or um, protection of the CO2. We still need better models for the physics of multi-phase flow. And Sally Benson, who you met this morning, has been at the forefront of developing these models. Um, we need better models for the geomechanics. So we have a lot of experience from oil and gas where we've pulled oil and gas out of the subsurface. We've depressurized it. But CO2 injections are going the opposite direction. We're overpressurizing the subsurface. And that can lead to induced seismicity and migration of the CO2 up fractures that are moved by that overpressurization. 
um, reservoir characterization, we usually use this doing seismic tools. It's how we find oil and gas. And so we want to be able to locate the faults and permeability structures that might actually rupture or serve as conduits for CO2 migration. And then finally, the one area where I think we have the least amount of expertise is in what to do if the CO2 leaks. We know a lot about plugging wells most of the time. Um, <laughs> but we don't know how to plug something as diffuse as a fault. So if we have a rupture along a large fault, how do we actually stop the CO2 from migrating upwards? And most of the problems there are in terms of materials, sealants that are resistant to CO2, um, they need to have a little bit lower viscosity than what you'd use to plug a well, and they need to have long setting time. So there's a big materials problem on that side. And then chemical trapping, there's just a fundamental problem with the subsurface in that most of the rocks in these sedimentary environments and most of the fluids just don't have very much calcium, magnesium, and iron. And so we just can't turn the CO2 into carbonates because we don't have enough reactant. Um, and so that results in slow time scales of mineral precipitation. But I would argue that for the most part, the physics and chemistry of geologic carbon storage are very well developed and field tested. And I argue this in part because we have a long experience with the subsurface, both extracting oil and gas. And it turns out using CO2 as what we call a working fluid for enhanced oil recovery. And so in this process, it happens a lot throughout the US. They inject CO2 down to get more oil and gas out. So we have a lot of experience doing this. Why aren't we doing it? Um, my, this is my personal opinion. My personal opinion is it comes down to economics and policy. So right now, the price of CO2 capture is quite high. It's upwards of $60 a ton. The DOE goal is to get it to $40 a ton by 2035. Um, when we think about long-term site management for these CO2 injection sites, when we wanted to store nuclear waste, we decided that that nuclear waste needed to stay there for a million years. That's a long time. What is the right time for CO2? Should it be 100 years, 1,000 years? That costs more money if we extend that timeline. Um, pipeline and transport requirements can be substantial, and that's very site-specific. Um, and finally, there's just no economic incentive to do sequestration. Right now, even for enhanced oil recovery, they're using natural CO2 that they've taken out of the ground. They're piping it to far-reaching locations and using it for oil and gas recovery. And right now, that natural CO2 is at $20 a ton. So you can see the economics of 20 versus 60. Um, the other challenge is on the societal side, there's been a growing pushback for geological storage. Um, European countries are now starting to say, no, we're just not going to do it. Um, the US has been pushing back as well. And so basically, there's a problem with access to geological storage. And finally, it's not clear that the new EPA rule 111D will pass, but it doesn't seem likely in its current form to pr promote widespread adoption of GCS. So those are some of the challenges. Where are we? Um, we have actually a lot of, as I mentioned, experience with EOR. We have a couple of sites that have been injecting CO2 for long time spans. Um, one is Sleipner, which is a, you can't, there's actually a map under here, but you can't see it. Um, Sleipner's up in the North Atlantic, um, off the coast of Norway. They've been injecting CO2 from a um, gas uh, pre-combustion plant um, for, since 1996, so a long time. Um, Weyburn was a big test site for enhanced oil recovery with CO2 sequestration. And Sala, which is in northern Africa, was shut down recently, but it was another test injection site. Um, Snowbeat is another site, which is up in um, the North Atlantic, another pre-combustion CO2 capture and injection site. Um, and then Gorgon, which is off the north coast of Australia, which is the biggest to date. It's about four megatons per year. So remembering we need to get to two gigatons per year, roughly, for GCS to be where we need it to be. So that's still a big number relative to these relatively small um, test injections. But for the most part, all of these have been successful. The only one that had a problem was Insula. So we can do it. Um, there are you know, certainly more uncertainties, and particularly on the economics and, and regulatory side that need to be worked out. But I think an important question is, what are other possibilities? And for all of you thinking about your future here as graduate students, of course, these are important things to think about. Um, and so I'll, I'll just mention one on the geologic storage side. There are, of course, many others on the efficiency and um, other aspects of energy systems. This is one called mineral carbonates. And so you can see this has both a large carbon storage capacity, 
and also um, what we think of as a like long characteristic storage time. We're just basically going to turn the CO2 into rocks. The other thing I'll mention, which is maybe one of those technologies that could be 50 to 100 years out, but would be wonderful if we could get it to work, is that the subsurface, these oil and gas reservoirs, are highly reducing conditions. And so it's actually thermodynamically favorable for CO2 to be reduced to another form. And so maybe one possibility is that long term <laughs> in the future, we could actually inject the CO2 down and engineer some reactions that would turn it into something more useful. OK. So I'll just say a little bit about the mineral carbonation example. Um, and just give you a sense for where this is. And so this is now another map of the subsurface, a cross-section through the subsurface. These are the sandstone and petroleum reservoirs that we talked about earlier. And we think of these as basically the weathered residues of other rocks. And so over here in the green is our California state rock, the serpentinite, which we think of as an ultramafic or crystalline rocks. And these are magnesium and iron-rich rocks that were formed in the top of the Earth's mantle, so the upper mantle, and they were brought up to the Earth's surface through tectonic processes. And so they're basically these reservoirs of chemical equilibrium, and they're very out of equilibrium at Earth's surface conditions. And so they tend to react spontaneously to form carbonates. And so one possibility is to inject the CO2 into these very reactive rocks and turn it into a mineral, a carbonate mineral. The challenge is that these are dominantly low permeability rocks, so they have less surface area for flow and reactions to occur, whereas these less reactive rocks have very high porosity and high permeability, and so you can just get a lot more CO2 in there by volume, and so that's sort of the, the trade-off. What's interesting about mineral carbonation is that nature has actually figured out how to do this. And we have a field site. This is a picture of it. It's near Livermore, California, which is one of the largest magnesium carbonate deposits in the world. Um, and you can see these white things are actually the carbonate veins sticking out of the mountain. This is a picture of the mine workings. And we've been able to reproduce this experimentally. These are carbonate minerals. Um, right? There's a carbonate mineral forming on the surface of a magnesium carbonate mineral. So we haven't figured exactly how these large veins formed, um, but this is Professor Brown from the School of Earth Sciences actually looking at one of these large veins down underground in this amazing example of mineral carbonation. And so I'm going to wrap up. I'll leave you with one last thought. This is a graph from the recent IPCC Working Group report on climate mitigation. And what they looked at is a scenario of 450 ppm CO2 by 2030, 2050, and 2100 with carbon capture and storage and without carbon capture and storage. And one thing that's immediately noticeable about this no carbon capture and storage 450 ppm goal is that only five to three, three to five of the models that they used for the 450 ppm with CCS could actually find a solution. So it means that most models couldn't figure out how to get us to 450 ppm without CCS. And the models that did appear to have done a lot of that through changes in this category of agricultural agriculture, forestry, and other land use, which again we said was a relatively uncertain component of carbon storage because of the rapid turnover of soil carbon pools. Um, and so I think the longer we wait, the more we need GCS, and I will leave it at that. Um, <laughs> Hopefully, um, this gave you an overview of both the carbon cycle and, and some of the scale of the, the problem that we're all thinking about. And I just have to say, finally, in closing, that I forgot to say this at the beginning, but I would love to welcome you all to Stanford. And I have a bit of jealousy every time all the graduate students show up because you have an amazing access to resources on energy and climate here at Stanford. And I'm quite sure that you will all take full advantage of those resources, but also make really important lasting contributions, both during your time at Stanford and beyond. Because as I've shown you, we have some really challenging problems ahead of us. So thank you. I'm related, but uh, in Siberia, the reports of uh, this permafrost melting and lots of melting going through, that's going to come out of the permafrost. So we have a sequestration technology that can handle kind of like that. Is that something that happened? Is there anything going on?
That's a good question. That, you know, the, there are obviously major concerns about permafrost and methane release from permafrost. I think right now we don't have a firm enough handle on the actual science of how those methane eruptions occur. Um, and I don't think there's a good answer to it as far as I can tell. Yeah. Anything that's happening gas-wise at the, at the shallow surface is very hard to manage. <laughs> So you mentioned that the main application of GCS is um, capturing carbon from concentrated sources like power plants. Um, is there any technology uh, available to capture from more diffuse sources or even from the atmosphere? Or is it once the carbon gets up there, all that's around? People are trying to do diffuse capture. I think. You know, if you think about an atmosphere of 450 ppm carbon versus a very fairly concentrated point source, the energetics are really unfavorable for um, carbon capture from a diffuse source. Uh, Jen Wilcox's book, so Jen's a professor here in energy resources, she wrote a book on carbon capture, and I think she goes through the actual feasibility of a lot of these different, almost geoengineering strategies. Um, people have talked about taking serpentine, the state rock, and sprinkling it around the tropics as a way to, you know, try to remove atmospheric CO2. But I think most of those strategies don't look very feasible at this time. So it's a challenge, yeah. I'm wondering how, how well we understand the role of geochemistry in, in seal integrity over long term. Is it going to be a, uh, a strengthening or a weakening phenomenon? It really depends on the type of rock um, and what the, the dominant cement is between the grains. Um, for the most part, the reactions are still so slow that the cap rock plus the supercritical CO2 isn't actually very reactive. You really need the CO2 dissolved in the water. So I think over the, the long time span, most of the studies have shown that the cap rock, and these are big cap rocks, they're you know, 5, 10 meters thick, so it takes a really long time to get the CO2 in, um, that there isn't a substantial change in the porosity permeability of these cap rocks over time from the CO2 rich fluids. That could be different in a fault zone where you have you know, more damage and, and more permeability for the fluids to enter. But for the most part, they're pretty non-reactive. Yeah, yeah. Last question, yeah. Just a, a metric question to help me conceptualize how much actual storage we need. You know, we have like three and a half T's of, of what we call working gas storage that we use during the, you know, the winter when it gets cold. I mean, how much, would, how much of this would that solve if, you know, that switch to hold carbon instead of holding gas? Because, you know, we're talking like t tons here and that stuff's in T's, so I just don't know. Uh, yeah, we need, you know, let me go back to this. I didn't put the, oh, I didn't put the, the numbers on here, but um, for example, the oil and gas reservoirs are about 150, I think it would be, yeah, 150 gigatons total in oil and gas reservoirs for CO2 to get to the 60 years. So, you know, people have talked about doing, um, short-term CO2 storage where you would take the CO2 from the power plant, inject it into the subsurface to store it, and then you would pipe it back out for, you know, enhanced oil recovery or other processes. Um, but you do need, you know, a pretty large amount of space to store the CO2. You know, small-scale operations could be effective in some places. But yeah, we're talking about the gigaton scale. Okay, let's thank uh, Kate again.